Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Coming up on our show, one woman's mission to achieve social and economic justice. We talk with the new executive director of Dream Corps in Oakland. But first, it's been a day of fast changing news. Hours after vocally defending his group's plan to rally at San Francisco's Critsy Field Saturday, Patriot Prayers founder Joey Gibson said he's calling it off. He said he plans to hold a press conference instead, not far from a planned counter rally at Civic Center. We've decided that um, tomorrow really seems like a setup. Um, it doesn't seem safe. A lot of people's lives aren't going to be in danger tomorrow. Before making that surprise announcement, Gibson spoke to us about his philosophy and why he wants to come to the Bay Area. Mr. Gibson, thank you for being with us. Thank you. What does your group Patriot Prayer stand for? Well, it's not so much a group, it's more of a philosophy, but it's, it's really about bringing love and peace, um, promoting free speech and freedom, um, really getting away from the politics, don't really care who you vote for, don't really care if you're left or right, but it's really about bringing together good people um, and start to focus on some of the cultural problems that we have in this country. But House uh, Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi calls your gathering a white supremacy gathering. You say you're not a white supremacist, but what is it about your message, do you think, that resonates with white supremacists? Because they do show up to your, your rallies, and so do white nationalists. Yeah, so like when one or two show up and we have 300 people, it, they do hijack the message, and that's a huge problem. And it's unacceptable. It's something we need to work on. One example I use is, is when I see moderate liberals marching peacefully in the streets who don't want to cause any damage to any property, and then two, you know, a couple Antifa members show up, hijack it, and start breaking windows, start burning stuff down, and all the media does is focus on those few individuals who want to cause problems. It's kind of the same thing. So basically, what well, we have a problem on both the left and the right if, is we have extremists that are trying to use our platform, okay, to get their message out. If that's the case, though, are you still planning to have Kyle Chapman uh, as a speaker at your event on Saturday? He was arrested and charged for allegedly hitting an anti-fascist protester with a billy club at a rally in March in Berkeley. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm, I'm, I'm all for peace and I'm trying hard to promote people to be, have nonviolent actions. But at the end of the day, I believe it's your God given right to self-defense. These Antifa members, they go around attacking people all the time. OK, and there's nothing wrong with Americans defending themselves. I don't think it's it doesn't look good because the cameras just show a bunch of people brawling. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm going to ask moderate liberals, you know, if they have issues with extremists on the right, I would ask them to, to speak out against the extremists on their side, too, because Antifa's running all over the place, pouring acid on people, beating people up, you know, innocent people. They're not just beating up people who they think is racist. They're beating up people who stand against them. What you're saying, I would think a lot of people would counter that and say, look at what happened in Charlottesville. There may be some on the left who are committing violence, but in Charlottesville, it was someone on the right who rammed a car into protesters and killed a woman. Absolutely, and that's a horrible thing, right? Because, because hate is hate. It doesn't matter what their political ideology is. If you're out there looking to hurt people to further your own political agenda, that's evil, that is wrong, period. Are you concerned about violence at your event on Saturday? And if you know that there's a risk of violence, how are you dealing with that? Yeah, no, we're, we're extremely concerned about it. Um, it's always a concern. Um, you know, there's going to be supposedly 2,000 Antifa members that's going to show up, and they want violence. They want to. They want to scare people off. I think there's also a concern Probably. that white supremacists and white nationalists will show up as well, not just Antifa members. Absolutely. There will be a couple that will show up, I'm sure. And I, we think there, sure I think there's concern a that more, a couple, the more than a couple will show up. I think there, there, there's that concern that there will be more than a couple that show up. On the white supremacist if there side. is if there okay you know what what would be a huge concern if 2,000 Nazis showed up or Klan's members showed up right and we're running through the streets breaking windows and burning stuff down that would scare that that would I would be extremely afraid of that right now realistically I think that there may be a couple that show up but oh okay let's say 10 show up we got to make sure that they have nothing to do with us we can't let them in we don't want them just like we don't want Antifa so they're both a problem, and it's it's the, the thing is, is is we have to speak out against all extremists. Why did you decide to have this rally in San Francisco, and what is your goal? What is your purpose for having it here, in this city? So one of the things that we do traditionally is we go into a lot of these areas where, um, where they, we kind of feel like it's intolerant, intolerant of ideas and thoughts. Um, in Portland, in Seattle, for example, we know that 
a lot of the people in Portland and Seattle are good liberals. They're good, moderate liberals who believe in free speech, they believe in love, they believe in freedom, but they have these extremists on the left that are the loudest. And so it looks like the social justice warriors and Antifa and all these people represent the left in these, 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 uh, these big cities like Portland and Seattle, but they don't, they're just the loudest. You know, same thing with San Francisco. There was a poll done and, you know, half of San Francisco, even after Nancy Pelosi said we're a white supremacist group, half of San Francisco said we should be allowed to have our rally. And um, I believe it was 58 percent believe that that um, San Francisco is becoming more intolerant. And so it's not about going into these areas to just, you know, just to stand up against San Francisco as an entirety. We're actually going in there to let moderate liberals know that that we understand that that these extremists don't represent your city. And we do want to bring moderate left and moderate right together. I believe that's the key to get rid of these extremists on both sides. As you know, there are a lot of security concerns surrounding your event on Saturday in San Francisco. Have you been talking with law enforcement and what are you negotiating with them in terms of how to make sure this is a safe event? Yeah, so police officers, you know, when they're not held back by politicians, their number one goal is to make sure everyone's safe. So I always try to negotiate, try to, you know, find, get a fine balance, you know, to make sure that um, our word gets out there, but at the same time, everyone stays safe. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, police officers um, will make some restrictions for good intention to make sure everyone's safe, but then sometimes it limits our ability to get our word out there, to have free speech. So we just kind of try to work together and get things worked out. And when you say when, when police officers aren't held back by politicians, they do a better job of keeping things safe. What do you mean by that? Well, it's notorious. California is notorious for having several cities where the mayor tells the police to stand down, including San Jose, Berkeley, and you know we'll see what happens in San Francisco. But it's they're notorious for letting Antifa try to run run these conservatives or libertarians or whoever they may be out of town, and um, the police are given orders directly by the mayor. Well, I think the orders are to. Uh control anybody who becomes violent, whether they're on the right or left. Yeah, arrest anyone who breaks the law. That's the way it should be. It, there shouldn't be politics. So when the police stand down then and, and they just let people battle on the streets, that's not okay. That's not right. They shouldn't take sides. They shouldn't, it shouldn't matter who breaks the law. It should be, you know, if you assault someone, you know, and it's not self-defense, you need to be arrested and taken to jail. Uh, and also, finally, a right-wing rally is planned for uh, Sunday in Berkeley. Are you planning to stick around and attend that as well? Yeah, I'll, absolutely. I'll be there. All right. Joey Gibson with Patriot Prayer, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And joining me now in the studio for further analysis are KQD reporter Farida Javala Romero. She'll be covering Saturday's rally. Steve McCutcheon, educator and former member of the Black Panther Party and Eva Patterson, president and co-founder of the Equal Justice Society. Thank you all for being here. Eva, what's your reaction to what you just heard from Joey Gibson of Patriot Prayer? I found Joey to be absolutely fascinating, and I think he's had a very great media coach because he was able to talk about what he's doing without really saying who he is and the people that he attracts. He attracts white supremacists, neo-Nazis, and fascists. He seems to think we have forgotten what we've seen over the past few weeks. People were in Charleston protesting against people who wanted to uh, make sure that Robert E. Lee's statue, a symbol of slavery and the bondage of my people, stayed up. You had ministers, you had people who were peacefully protesting, and they were beaten within an inch of their lives by some of the people he is associated with. And then one lady, Heather Heyer, was mowed down and murdered. It's interesting that he has picked progressive communities in Portland, Seattle, and San Francisco to have his marches staged at. That's no mistake. They want to take us on. The final thing I'll say is, of course, San Francisco, San Franciscans feel that they should be able to march. We support the First Amendment, which says no matter how odious the speech, you have a right to say it. So you support having their rally at Chrissy Field on Saturday? I don't support it, but I can't oppose it because I belong to the ACLU and I believe in the First Amendment. I think these are horrible people. I wish they would go away. Um, but our country says they have a right to march and protest. And Farida, you'll be out there covering the, the rally tomorrow. Um, what can we expect to see? You've been talking to a lot of people about this. 
Well, it's not going to be a regular Saturday in San Francisco on, um, or uh, in Berkeley uh, later in the weekend. Um, we know that there's going to be very heavy police presence. Uh, the U.S. Park Police is going to be in charge of um, um, the, the security at the event, but also very heavy uh, presence from SFPD. There's going to be restricted access to the park. The only way people will be able to get uh, to Chrissy Field is by foot and, uh, and the Marina Boulevard. So they're completely banning vehicles even bikes uh, from uh, the park and I think part of it is they want to prevent any type of violent clash uh, especially after Charlottesville. Steve you um, were once with the Black Panther Party yeah. which had a strong anti-racism message in the uh, 1960s and 70s. This also had its own controversial history. Um, as you're looking at this do you think counter protesters should go to the Patriot prayer rally and and other right wing rallies this weekend okay, given that people have the choice to attend or not to attend um, during the period of time that we organized and looking at what the objectives of modern organizations are modern groups are this group and these individuals have no agenda they have no platform they have no program people are coming out for the excitement and to be incited you know, there is not there's nothing concrete there's nothing qualitative that the people will take away from these programs these type of events but did you think there's not a strong message they could send look at what happened in boston when a small right-wing rally was overwhelmed by counter-protesters who came up by who came out by the tens of thousands of people. Okay, again, uh, showing up just for the excitement, just for the excitement, just to oppose someone else, to oppose someone else for what, and then to be on the verge, be on the cusp of counter-violence or actions against. Uh, uh, individual safety. These were not wise ideas. These were not wise strategies and tactics. If you're interested in the uh, safety and the well-being of people who are involved, if we want what should to be people involved, do then? If, if people want to be involved and want to make a difference and 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 talk mm -hmm. about unity and peace, what do you want to, people to to do if you don't think they should be out as a counter protester? If, if you wish to uh, challenge an idea or if you wish to challenge a program, a policy then prepare something concrete, something objective that people can attend that minimizes the chance of their safety being violated, their health being violated, and something that is going to provoke uh, law enforcement and other agencies uh, to step in and intervene. We do not need in any, in any type of event uh, something that incites and precipitates violence. Uh, Frida, you seem like you want to say something here. Yeah, I feel like something that's different about these events this weekend is that I see people on the street talking about it all the time. Like just this morning, I saw this uh, pedestrian, you know, talking to someone on the phone about whether to go or not. I think this is um, some a debate for a lot of people on whether they should just try to ignore <laughs> what's happening, these rallies in Crazy Field and also in Berkeley, or try to be there and in an organized peaceful fashion and um, just this morning I spoke with a Latina immigrant in San Francisco who came here because of the ethnic diversity of the area and she really feels like she needs to show up just to show um, you know these these other folks what, um, and, what and where are some of the counter rallies that are scheduled well we have one of the biggest ones is going to be at Civic Center Plaza at the pretty much the same time as the uh, protest prayer rally there's going to be also a number of events in the Presidio in Chrissy Field and in uh, Baker Beach uh, there's going to be a clown event that's planned there that. <laughs> um, and there's going to be a human chain mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, yeah, and then in other parts of the city, I heard in Hayward, some faith groups are also having a big uh, peaceful rally. And what are you hearing from people as you're out there in the neighborhoods talking to, uh, to, to folks? Because um, is there a feeling of anxiety or dread or do people feel that this is a chance, an opportunity to uh, give a different kind of message? Um, I think it's really mixed depending on who you're talking to. I spoke with uh, residents of the Presidio yesterday, for example, and there's um, an apartment complex there for military veterans. Um, a lot of the, uh, the people there seem to be really, um, they find it very offensive that Patriot Prayer Rally is happening mm -hmm. in a place like San Francisco. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of these folks are African American and they feel like the military is about unity and that you um, can't divide people by color if you care about this country. 
country. Um, and then other people are just annoyed that so much change is happening in that part of the city and that it's going to be kind of shut down. Um, they're leaving town or, you know, they're hunkering down in their homes. Steve, did you have a point you wanted to make about um, the counter rallies? Just that, that many of the organizers today and the ones, again, who participate or just venture out just for the sight, just for the spectacle, either they don't seem to have an idea of what's on their agenda or they do not understand the agenda that's being presented to them. Now, if you have an idea such as uh, the different programs, the different counter protests that were mentioned, okay, fine, attend those. This decreases the possibility, the probability that there are going to be clashes. Otherwise, when you have so many people who are going to disagree for one idea, one statement or another, you just set the stage for people to clash. You're going to have that opposition which reaches aggression levels coming into contact and all you're going to have is a, a boiling pot where there's nothing left but this uh, the, the boil over. Here's one thing I would say to anybody who's going out there. You're mm -hmm. going to be tempted to smack somebody. You're going to hear things that are terribly offensive, but you've got to show restraint because they want us to act crazy. They call us Antifa. We're just people who don't like racism and anti-Semitism and fascism. I heard about one particular rally where a flag fell and a person was going to pick up the flag and hurl it at a racist and a Black Lives Matter person got up and stopped that. So please exercise restraint. They want to show pictures of progressive people of color and our white allies in San Francisco and Berkeley acting crazy. You've got to be restrained. If you don't think you can be restrained, stay home. We are living at a time, though, where there seems to be so much tension mm -hmm. and so much bitterness. And Steve, I, you know, because you were active um, in, in the 60s, does the current divisiveness feel like the 60s all over again? Is it that bad? It's a, it's a different chapter. Mm -hmm. It's a different chapter in terms of the, uh, the conditions. The conditions still exist. The actual conditions still exist. They've just been given new names, new labels these days. And the actors, the actors uh, who have um, come onto the scene the, these days, they, they brought new descriptions and new ideas to define old conditions, to define old conditions of clothing, poverty, uh, lack of education, medical care, policing justice, uh, uh, fault in the criminal justice system. They are just changing. Uh, the terminology, but those conditions still exist, and there's no way to avoid the concrete uh, realities that existed then and now. And people, when they attend these events, should understand what are the ideas that we are listening to, and what is it that we expect to achieve by participating in the event, and what we expect to take home. What I would add to that, though, is that racism has been weaponized and politicized because Nixon and Lee Atwater and those folks in 1970 employed the Southern strategy and decided that they wanted to have all the kind of racist people in the Republican Party and we're seeing the results of that, a polarized Supreme Court, voter suppression, uh, campaign finance reform, blown up. So they have taken it from just kind of random racist to a whole political party whose aim is to undermine the goals of people of color. It's very that's what bothers me. And you have a, a Washington DC that is dysfunctional and is not helping people of color. And, and, and on the issue of politics, mm -hmm. Eva, freedom of expression is much less comprehensive uh, in many parts of Europe than it is here, right? Exactly. For example, in, in Germany, Nazi symbols and Holocaust denial are right. illegal. And Germany, in fact, recently just passed a bill that would fine social media companies millions of dollars if they don't delete racist posts within 24 hours. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Should the U.S. consider more stringent stringent restrictions on racist speech? I think it will never happen. You have a president of the United States who seems to think that Confederate flags and statues are just fine and are emblematic of our heritage as opposed to emblematic of slavery and bondage and rape and murder. So, But regardless I think, of who's in office, do you think that we need more stringent restrictions on racist and hate speech in this country? I think it would never pass and I think people should be allowed to say what they think as long as they don't hurt me but I also believe the symbols of racism should come down wherever they are. Um, we have a problem with racism, white supremacy, white nationalism in this country because it's institutionalized indeed, historically. Indeed. 
And unless those attitudes and beliefs, unless they wither away over time, they're going to remain. You can, you can policy anything. You can put anything into policy. You can police anything. But unless those attitudes and behaviors which change people on a daily basis, something that they believe and can act on, unless mm -hmm. those right. change, then all the policies uh, in we this administration or forthcoming will not mm -hmm. change people's actions on the right, the left, or anywhere along the road. We will have to leave it there. Steve McCutcheon, thank you so much. Also, Eva Patterson and Farida Jabvala Romero, thank you all. Thank, thank you. All thank you. you. Thank all of you. And thank you. <laughs> we turn now to one woman's fight for those who are disadvantaged and often forgotten. Vin Trong is the new CEO of the Oakland nonprofit Dream Corps, which was founded by author and CNN contributor Van Jones. Trong was born to a family of refugees, and that experience inspires much of what she does today. And Vin Trong joins me now. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. So your organization's top priorities getting, include getting more disadvantaged youth tech jobs, right. to cut the prison population in half, and also to build an inclusive green economy. Are there common challenges that you see spanning all those three goals right now? They're all connected to America's toughest problems, which is the wealth divide. And how do we make sure that we're connecting people together to solve some of America's toughest problems? So the Dream Corps, I like to say, is like the Marine Corps for the American dream. Cut 50, our criminal justice program is to free people from prison, making sure we're reducing prison population by 50% in 10 years. For Yes We Code is about making sure that we're actually connecting people in low-income communities to the future of our economy. I live in Oakland where I grew up. There's a lot of people coming to Oakland now from Silicon Valley. We want to make sure we're connecting Oaklanders to the jobs in Silicon Valley as well. And then finally with Green For All, we're facing the toughest problems around the environment now, existentially so. How do we make sure that we're protecting families in Oakland and other communities like Oakland against this problem? My community actually has higher lead poisoning in our bloods than Flint, Michigan. Really? Yeah. Um, so what are you doing about that? We have a mom's campaign that's coming up. And so one of the things that we know is whether you're a mom in Flint, Michigan, mm -hmm. or a mom in Oakland like I am, or a mom in New Orleans, no matter the context of which you live, it's non-negotiable for us to not have our kids bathe in our own bath waters. Mm -hmm to not be able to have our kids play in their backyards. I can't let our kids play in the backyards often. And then not to be able to have the ability to walk to your mailbox without a mask on. That's actually happening in Richmond, California and in mm. Bakersfield, California. And so our mom's campaign is to say, these EPA budget cuts that the U.S. president is proposing for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to cut our budget by one third, it is abhorrent. And so we want people to join our campaign with moms across the country protecting the future for our kids. And for you, you have an interesting uh, personal life story. Your parents were Vietnamese refugees. Yeah. You were born in a refugee camp. Your family worked picking crops in this yeah. country, laboring in yeah. sweatshops. Um, can you tell us about that experience? That's right. So they came here as refugees from Vietnam after the war. The only jobs they could find was picking strawberries and snow peas in Portland, Oregon. We graduated to work in garment factories or sweatshops in Oakland, California. My mom's one dream for me was to be the first kid in a family of 11 to go to college. And I did. I went to Cal. <laughs> made mom proud. Made mom proud. <laughs> well, you went to yeah. Cal and you majored in rhetoric. So I did. did I. Yes. I feel like we're like, you know, sisters from another mother, right? You know, I came as a refugee, one of eight kids. We're even wearing similar shoes today. It's kind of eerie, Vin. <laughs> Hi, you're my, you're my twin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. Finally. Yes. Sorry to ever. <laughs> with, with that background, what was the one moment that made you realize you wanted to be a community organizer? When I went to Cal, I used to think growing up in Oakland, dodging bullets literally at school on playgrounds was normal. When I got there, I began to not have to worry about my life going to campus and began to understand that the conditions of Oakland were very similar to other conditions around the country that were low-income communities and communities of color. And to me, that just was not right. And so for me, I redefined success so that it wasn't about just escaping poverty, but to end it. And uh, to that end, during the Obama administration, you received the White House Champion of Change Award That's for right. your work on the project's Green for All, yes. uh, working with communities heavily affected by pollution. Right. What are some of the things that you are now doing to turn that around? 
We want to make sure that we're defending against the bad policies. These regulations that the president is proposing is going to hurt our kids. So we want to defend against the budget cuts with our mom's mobilizing campaign. We also want to advance solutions. So in Oregon, Washington, and New York, we're showing up in support. We're bringing in celebrities. We're bringing in money. We're bringing in access. And to help organizers in those states advance good solutions around the environment. And you also co-led yeah. the campaign around Senate Bill 535, which right. created the Polluters Pay Fund. Yeah. How, right. did, how does that work? California has a polluters pay. We make polluters pay for the poison they put into the air. A coalition of friends and I came together and said, let's make sure that the money goes to the very communities of people who have been paying with their health and their lives. It's become the biggest fund in history for low-income communities, almost a billion dollars. And the money Amazing. goes to affordable housing, free solar programs, free bus passes for seniors and students. We got a woman a free solar program, uh, a free solar panel for her home in Fresno. Her electricity bill was $200 on average a month. It dropped to $1.50 overnight because of these solar panels. That is an amazing yeah. uh, change. Uh, when you were hired as CEO of Dream Corps just a couple of months ago, congratulations, um, it was announced that one of your key roles would be to help lead the Trump resistance. What does that mean for you exactly, and how do you plan to do that? We're already well on our way. Leading the Trump resistance means advancing a future for our country that is about connection, about unity, about working together. That's what he's been fighting against when he sided with the KKK and white supremacy. We're saying, let's, let's work together. We had a 14-city uh, tour around this country, from Nashville to Dallas to New York to Oakland. And together, we connected people. And people were so hungry. It was such a diversity in the audience. People wanted to heal. They wanted to come together and to rise up for healing and for, for unity in this, uh, in this future. All right. Well, Ben Truong, my newly discovered twin sister, it's been a pleasure to have you here today. Welcome to the family. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. And that does it for us. Next week, we'll take a special look at California's cannabis industry. You can find more of our coverage at kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you for joining us.